This is one of the cooling rooms at Dugdale Packing Company in St. Joseph, Missouri. On today's U.S. Farm Report, Andy Knightsling, an assistant in the meat department of the National Farmers Organization, will be showing us beef cuts as well as evaluating and the grading of beef carcasses. This is a part of what you'll see on today's show, so stay tuned. Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. The subject of this week's show is the National Farmers Organization's Cattle Bargaining Program, and this is part two. Last week, you'll recall, we dealt with this same subject. This week, we bring it to a conclusion. Once again, I welcome back as a special guest on my far right, Mr. Gene Potter. Gene is the director of the Meat Commodity Department of the National Farmers Organization. Gene, welcome back. Glad to be here, Bill. And uh, next to Gene, on my immediate right, is the assistant to the director of the Meat Commodity Department, Mr. Andy Knightsling. Hello, Andy. Hi, Bill. Welcome to our show. Thank you. You're going to be seeing quite a bit of Andy today because he's going to give us a great deal of instruction and training uh, the same kind of instruction and training that is passed along to NNFO plant representatives in packing plants all across the country. Andy, last week on our show, Gene talked to us about the fact that many dealers and so-called market experts talk about protecting the cattle producers' interests in uh, the packing plants, but they talk about it without having had uh, much experience and no training at all. But this is not so, right? where NFO is concerned. That's correct, Bill. Our plant men are trained on the live bases, also on the meat evaluation, mm -hmm. the carcass evaluation. Mm -hmm. The plant man knows how to properly identify the cattle, how to handle the cattle when, they, when they're received. This uh, reduces our, our uh, bruises. Also, he makes sure that the cattle are rested properly before they're killed. He checks the cattle in the plant itself on the kill floor to make sure the trim isn't in excess, to get a regular packing house trim and nothing more. Mm -hmm. Here's where your weight is, and this is where your money is dealt with, in the carcass. He checks the uh, dress scales to see that they're operating properly. He checks the in the cooler that all the cattle have a proper chill on them. If the cattle are fall, we call falling away, uh, you cannot get a proper grade on them. Make sure that is done. He also uh, is sort of a tour guide man in the plant when, when you have your uh, producers come in, want to see their cattle, he helps them out. Actually, uh, they're encouraged to come in, aren't they? Without a doubt. Yes. We'd like to see each and every one of them in there. Well, now, it takes a lot of training to prepare a plant representative to carry on those many duties efficiently. And this is the kind of training that you and Gene and the people in the, your department are carrying on with all of these plant representatives across the country, right? Yes. The fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, Andy will now show us the kind of training NFO representatives receive in the area of the quality grading of meat. Andy, the housewife, I think, uh, concerns herself mainly with prime and choice grades of meat, but the USDA designates a number of grades, does it not? Yes, they do, Bill. They designate eight different grades. There's the prime, your choice, your good, standard, utility, and on your cows, there's a cutter and canner, boner, and a uh, commercial. Well, now, <clears throat> to the man who raises cattle, Based on the current market, what is the difference in dollars and cents to him between having an animal graded prime, we'll say, and choice? 
On today's market bill, it'd be approximately uh, four and a half dollars. Four and a half dollars. Between the, say, standard and your prime carcass. Mm -hmm. Heifer and steer. All right, well, let's get into this grading matter, Andy, and uh, we'd like for you to show us uh, some of the things the, the grader looks for uh, when he uh, inspects the animal, inspects the carcass. Fine. Now, on the one hand, by the way, for our viewers, <coughs> we have here a prime carcass. This 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 animal is graded prime. Uh, this one is what is graded standard. Standard, yes. So there are about four grades actually between this animal and yes, this animal. Yes. Okay. First of all, Bill, when the grader looks at the animal, the animal is ribbed down. And by ribbed down we mean we mean it's by the twelfth rib and it's cut, just like this. Then the grader looks into the the uh, texture of the meat, the firmness of this meat. Now this animal here is a prime animal. The marbling, uh, by marbling I mean the specks of fatty tissue, it actually is like tallow, the coloring of, it, of the tallow is in this. Now this animal is an abundant amount of marbling. There's a, uh, it reaches anywhere from uh, a, uh, mostly abundant to down to traces. Uh, then they look at the conformation of your animal. Now, this animal, you can note the fullness of the round, the very plump round. Then go into your standard grade, such as this. Your round is sloped. It's far from being plump, such as this one. Again, you go back to your prime animal, your prime, your fullness of your loin. Your loin is popping out, so to speak. On your standard, it, it's sunken in. Now, this carcass for a standard is a, is a fairly good standard carcass. But as you can see by the two comparisons, the standard is considerably amount less than quality than the, the prime. And now, Bill, let's look at the marbling aspect of these two carcasses. You take the prime carcass, the, abundant, the abundance of marbling, and you compare it to the standard carcass with the traces of marbling. Well, now, exactly what is marbling, Andy? Marbling is the, actually, it, it deals with the quality of the cattle. Yeah. Uh, the more the marbling, the better the, the, the uh, taste, yes. the juiciness, and the, uh, the texture of the meat itself. The marbling itself is uh, tallow, I suppose, well, or it, is it fat, it, or what it, is it? it? Actually, it's uh, a substance like, like fat, uh -huh. but it isn't uh, considered fat. Yes. Well, then, if the marbling does all that to the cut of meat, of course, this is the very thing that the consumer should look for at the uh, point of purchase in the supermarket, right? Without a doubt. Bill, the uh, last two carcasses we looked at were prime and standard. We have a choice and a good in the front of us now. These well, are that's the, right between the other two, isn't that's it? That's right, that's right. Now, the animal uh, here is a very high good quality. Uh, you notice if we compare the choice mm -hmm. with this good, you can see that the marbling in here and the marbling on this choice is about the same, but it does lack in this area and in here. This would be an average choice. This would be a very high good. Well, in other words, in the good animal, uh, right here in, in the eye, there are many areas, really, when you look at it carefully, that do not have the marbling. That is correct. That's correct. And the marbling, although this is an average choice, does extend uh, quite thoroughly through through the eye. Correct. Now, this animal, within another, I would say, 30 days of feed, if not less, would have gone into the choice. Mm -hmm. This is what uh, a lot of packers call fallout choice cattle. But they are in the good grade. Well, Andy, aren't there some other important factors in carcass evaluation? Yes, there are, Bill. The sex and the maturity of the animal are quite important. Andy, how do you determine the sex of the animal as it hangs from the rail? Well, Bill, that's a very good question, a question that arises quite frequently to our members that come in for a grade and yield purpose for the first time. Now, on the steer, 
You'll notice that you have a, a pistol eye, they call a pistol eye. That's nothing other than a glob of meat that you can uh -huh. see very clearly on the steer. Then on the heifer itself, it lacks the pistol eye. You have, no, you have a, a glob of fat rather than the meat. Also, you have the H-bone on the heifer, which is straighter than the steer H-bone. You notice the steer has a curvature of the H-bone. The H-bone. H-bone, yes. Now on the heifer. The heifer in the area of the udder is smooth in comparing it with the steer. Uh, uh, this is called the cod fat on the steer. Mm -hmm. And you'll note again that it's rougher on the steer than it is on the heifer. Now, Bill, as we are talking about maturity, we have here a young choice steer, a yearling, to a, an old commercial cow. Now, if we compare the, the bone structure of these cows, this is, uh, of this cow to this steer, uh -huh. this is one of the ways they have in, in uh, classifying the maturity of the animal. Now, you can see the cartilage on this animal here is, is white and what they call a butt. Now this is the young steer. On this old commercial cow, this bone is completely ossified, it's completely white. This is a, a sign of age. Now up on the, the, the vertebrae, it's completely fused together. It's just one mass of bone. Mm -hmm. On your younger choice steer, there's areas of, of uh, soft substance between it, such as uh, a bone or your finger or such. This is how they, they don't classify, classify the animal as the age itself by years, but in the variation of old to young. How, what would be your guess, Andy, in the difference in age between uh, this animal that we looked at where the bone is completely ossified and this, uh, this animal here? Well, this is, uh, I, I would say, offhand, now this would be close to about two years old. This, I would say, with uh, being a safe guess, would be a good 10 years old. Well, now, the grader does this in order to arrive at his judgment in what this animal should grade. For example, on this older animal, you say is about 10 years old, the, uh, the eye looks pretty good. But uh, by opening the rib and uh, checking the bone, seeing the ossification, then the grader will grade this animal down a bit because of that, right? Yes, it will. For instance, if we had uh, take, you had mentioned that the marbling on this animal compared to this animal is fairly good. Well, yes, it is. But you notice the texture of this meat. It's as darker uh, compared to your young choice deer. This is a cherry red substance. This would be a deep red substance. Now, as far as youth goes, uh, in the grading, you can use your, your maturity will off-balance your marbling. In other words, if, if this animal is a little older, in order for it to go into the prime, you would have to have more marbling. Now, Andy Nightsling talks about the subjects of grubs, bruises, and yield grade. Now, is this an example of... Uh, Bruising, or is this uh, grub damage? This carcass, Bill, here is the example of bruises, basically transit bruises. Uh -huh. The damage is done away from the loin, but yet it may come back in. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the short rib, or actually the, all, the, the, all the rib itself is damaged, and you can see it's been cut out, completely cut out. Where is that uh, cutting of bruises done? Uh, and uh, this is all done in the kill floor. Uh -huh. uh, they ha it's a necessity to cut it out in the kill floor. It's against the government regulations to bring them in the cooler. Yeah. Any damage to your bruises? Uh, they, uh, the government has uh, investigated bruises quite thoroughly, and they feel that your bruises are basically done in sorting of cattle and in transit, uh, where you have uh, sorting out the cattle, you swing a gate, catches the animal in the side, and you think nothing of it. 
but as it's opened up, it has a uh, hemorrhaging of the laceration and so forth, and they just have to cut it completely out. They cannot uh, save that carcass at all, that, that meat. Well, now, here at Dugdale Packing Company in St. Joseph, NFO has its representative, Mr. Lester Carr, whom we have interviewed on U.S. Farm Report in the past. Uh, he has counterparts in uh, packing plants uh, all across the country, as I understand it. And this is one of the things I recall Lester said about his job here, that he is able to assist NFO members here at Dugdale in uh, this area of uh, the unloading of uh, beef cattle. When cattle come here to Dugdale, he can more or less oversee the unloading and uh, try to avoid uh, this bruising as much as possible because bruising of cattle obviously means a lower price for cattle. That is correct. We have in all of our plants, uh, the NFO men is, is <clears throat> gone over this with our people to come out as a, uh, a figure that they can arrive by what this animal would be worth to the packer and to the farmer. Uh, as we have gone through the carcasses all today, uh, the goods, the choice, and so forth, that this plant man is, is uh, actually taught this, so he knows what to look for in the plant to better our protection over our members. Well, let's talk about this carcass for a moment. Now, although it's pretty badly bruised, I noticed that the government grader has graded this carcass choice. So. Uh, where is the loss in the bruised animal? Is it in weight? Well, it is in weight to some degree, but it is also in the loss of the wholesale cuts. You have your wholesale cut. Now, this would be your loin in here. This is completely damaged, and this bruise may go back in a little further. Therefore, uh, some packers use it as a triple X loin or a triple K, whatever they see fit. Same as on your, on your rib itself. Your rib is bruised here. This is where your basic loss comes from. You can't sell this cut for the same price as you would sell a, yeah. an, a regular choice. It is choice grade, but it's the quality of the cut. Well, let's go over and take a look at this grub damage. <clears throat> Incidentally, uh, Andy, what is the grub? How does it affect the... Uh, the cattle. Well, a, a grub is, is a, a little insect that starts way back in the feedlot, and it goes up through the hooves of the animal and up into the loin. Now, if we, if we look at this, Bill, you see that the animal, when it's matured, it comes out of the loin itself, and you have the damage such as this, and then the damage of this. Now, this when the animal, is, when, the, when the insect is still in the carcass, it has to be cut out. And again, you get into the triple X loin or whatever you call it. You also have one in, right here. This is, this is a brute, uh, grub damage. Uh, this carcass, by the way, is not very, da the damage on this is minor. Uh, there are many, many worse carcasses than this, this where the complete loin is, is all dug in now, you'll notice that the meat itself on this carcass is not damaged, but the, the covering is. Now you take, you cannot age a loin like this because of the, the damage of the covering. If you leave this animal age, it'll, see the, it'll spoil the meat itself and not the outside. Well, once again, Andy, in the case of grub damage, does this lower the grade of the carcass, or is it just a cash matter? No, it is simply the value of the animal. Now, this animal, Bill, is a good. Uh, In other words, this animal would have graded good if it had had no damage. Yes, oh. that's correct. I would say 95%. Of course, you can get your, your bruises uh, and your grub so bad that you have to cut into the loin itself where you would normally break your uh, carcass for grading on, at the 12th rib. You may have to go down to the to the uh, 11th or so forth. If you notice, there's one rib on this hind. Uh, and this is where they, they cut it, and this is where they grade it. But it is, uh, basically, it isn't the, the downgrading of the carcass. It is the carcass that is damaged to such a degree that they have to deduct it in the center. Andy, we've talked a great deal today about quality grading. What about yield grading? Well, Bill, in uh, 1965, the United States Agricultural Department introduced a yield grade system, whereas 
the carcass is evaluated to the cutability. By cutability, I mean the actual pounds of meat to the, to the pounds of the carcass. There's uh, three basics that they uh, take into consideration on a yield grade. That is the area, if we can kind of look at this, that is the area of your ribeye, your outside thickness of your fat, and the, uh, the pelvic, heart, and kidney fat. Mm -hmm. Also, you have the uh, weight factor into con takes into consideration. Yeah. Now, we have seen uh, the number one, and we've seen the number five. Is that the uh, range of uh, yield grading? No, Bill, there's a one, two, three, four, and five. Uh -huh. We have two extremes in the front of us. And this is, you can kind of see the actual uh, uh, size of your ribeye and the size of your, your uh, external fat. Well, now, it seems uh, rather obvious to me that uh, this should be graded uh, lowest in yield grade and this highest because the yield on this carcass will be so much less than this one, mainly as I see it because of all of the fat on the carcass. That, that's correct, but yet you also have to take into consideration your internal fat, your, your uh, kidney, pelvic, and uh, heart fat. Now, if you, if you can compare, you can see the the uh, amount of fat inside the cavity here compared to your yield grade yes, one. Yes. Now, in your verification, uh, you take a, a yield grade uh, one, for instance. What would approximately have about uh, four, uh, 13 to 14 inches of square uh, edible meat with a covering of perhaps maybe uh, 0.2 or to, uh, 0.8 or 9 or something in this area? Also, the percentage of the uh, kidney, heart, and pelvic fat. Now, if you have a bigger eye and you have a little more fat on the outside, this is taken into consideration. Now, you take the two animals and put them together, uh, I don't think there's much of a question of which one you yes. would rather have. Yet, they are both choice animals. One is worth considerably amount, uh, considerable amount more than the other, approximately in some cases, the uh, reports the government has put out up to $10.28, which yes. is a considerable amount to the retailer. Itself. I think this might be something uh, very new to the consumer, Andy. The consumer, of course, is aware of quality grading because this is important to him at the point of purchase. But this, this grading, yield grading, is really not of all that importance to the consumer, but it certainly is to, uh, to the, the cattle raiser and it is to the, to the man who buys the carcass, isn't that it? Very much so, Bill, and I feel we're going to see more yield grading of cattle. Some packing houses just do it a little at a time, very little yield grading. Some do all yield grading. But this is going to be uh, a thing, an upcoming thing, and the reason for this is when, the, when you bred an animal into a yield grade uh, one, mm -hmm. a man should be paid for a yield yeah. grade one. If it is fed, fortunately, these days we don't see too many yield grade fives. It wasn't too long ago that you did, but they're getting away from it, but yet you can see, again, the value of each carcass and being in the same grade. Well, all I can say is that this program has to be most impressive to everybody, and particularly to cattle producers. Now, uh, Gene, how does the cattle producer get into the program? Well, Bill, very simply, uh, first of all, he has to be a member of the NFO, the National Farmers Organization. And uh, for any non-members that might be uh, watching in with us, uh, of course, they can contact any local NFO member or call or write our national office here in Corning, Iowa. Uh, once they become a member, then uh, they're to contact their county bargaining structure or their county officers for direction as to how they can participate in this program. Well, this new marketing program is certainly a far cry from the old structure, wouldn't you agree? Yes, Bill, uh, we think it is. It's a dynamic new bargaining program that gives the producers the opportunity to participate with their production, uh, use their production in a block to where it can be used for their benefit, not against them. And they have representation uh, that uh, uh, make sure that their interests are protected, uh, 
uh, while they are using their, pro their uh, production to make progress in a bargaining program. I think that we're all aware of the fact that uh, we have lived with and under a marketing structure for a number of years that uh, has been termed by many as a competitive marketing system, that as producers, for some reason, we were getting the short end of the stick. And I think that as we become more knowledgeable about what actually goes on in livestock marketing, in this instance, particularly cattle marketing, we can see that there are many things that can be done if we work together as a group. To give you a little example, I'm sure all of you as cattle feeders have been in a sale barn, for instance, with three major companies, or three companies represented, buying cattle. And one of the buyers seems to buy all the heifers, and one of the buyers buys the majority of the steers, and consequently, another the majority of the cows. Uh, Many times, uh, there are kill they are killers that could use all three, but they have a tendency, it appears, not to want to compete against one another and buy a particular class themselves. In the overall bargaining program, many times when, as producers, uh, we participate, and the results that really indicate success become reasons for us to be concerned. I'd like to give you an example because not too long ago in uh, a meeting in Idaho, I believe it was, one of the national officers of the organization was there and a member of NFO had participated in a block bargaining program. Uh, he was relaying the conversation and was uh, discussing the fact that he had shipped some cattle out of Idaho to uh, a plant that NFO had a contract with, uh, some of his cattle to be sold. And he said before they even reached that plant, the local buyer that we've referred to before uh, was there offering me what appeared to be more money than I actually had uh, when selling through NFO's program. Well, this was success in itself because the day he loaded those cattle, uh, the, bar the NFO program was a price that was higher than what the local market was. Yet, before the cattle even reached the plant, the local buyer had come back and bid a higher price. Now, this is the success of the program, and the only thing that the producer has to do is keep that block together until that buyer is not only willing to pay a higher price, but willing to sign a contract with that block of production, with the group of members, with NFO, to maintain that price and protect the gains that the producer made. Gene, I want to thank you very much for being our guest once again on U.S. Farm Report. It's been our pleasure having you. Thank you, Bill. And uh, Andy, many thanks to you. Thank you, Bill. Our special guests on today's U.S. Farm Report have mis been Mr. Gene Potter, who is director of the Meat Commodity Department at the National Farmers Organization, and Andy Knightsling, an assistant to the director. U.S. Farm Report is seen on this station each week at this same time. Until we meet again, so long, everybody.